Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, family. Uh, are we hearing me? Yeah, yeah, oh, there we hear me. Good morning. Welcome to Enclave. This is the day the Lord has made, and he has made it for resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. What a beautiful day to come together, spring and new life. Welcome to Enclave. And uh, this is exciting. We're, we're gathering fine. Thank the Lord. Last year we did not meet here on Easter sun, Sunday. So what a blessing finally to come back. The nursery's open also. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> that is good news. And so, well, folks, I just want to let, let you know a few things. Turlock Pregnancy Center is going to start their baby bottle drive. And uh, last year we gave over $365. So we want to encourage you when you see the bottles, ask for one to put your uh, change in to give toward the Turlock Pregnancy Center. Uh, Marcy Peterson um, is looking for greeters. And so uh, folks that want to stand at the door and greet folks, we do need help there. Thank you. Also, uh, just so you know, Women of Enclave will not meet Tuesday on Zoom. Jane will be out of town, so they won't be meeting. But the men of Enclave will meet tomorrow uh, on Zoom. And we, we invite you to check it out uh, on your, your email. You should have gotten poss possibly a link. Um, the youth group won't be meeting this afternoon. We'll, we'll meet again next Sunday at 3 p.m. And um, a final note, Linda White uh, is asking for prayer. Um, she needs a, a, a room and a home, and she's uh, been going through some family stress. And uh, so she wanted me to make, make an announcement to ask for prayer uh, this morning as we gather together. And so now I'm going to ask my dearest, loveliest wife to come up and read scripture for us as we enter into the Lord, his word, and his, the gift of resurrection today. Thank you. Good morning. Our passage this morning is from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have done for us, how you've taken all our sins on yourself, and then you allowed yourself to be punished for them so that we would not be punished. Lord, thank you for that. And thank you so much for rising from the dead, because you cannot stay dead. You're God. Lord, we know you love us. You care about us. You want to come into our lives and change us for those who don't know you. Lord, thank you for the sweet fellowship we have with you and how you change our lives, how you bring us into fellowship with you and your Son and your Holy Spirit. And we want to live this life, Lord. Thank you. Jesus, we ask this morning that you would speak to all our hearts and that you would help us to come to know you better and to love you more and to adore you as you deserve, Lord. Thank you. We ask this in your dear Son's name. Amen. Amen, and good morning. He is risen, isn't he? 
Um, I wanted to start this morning um, just with some questions to get us thinking about siblings. So I promise this is an Easter message, but we're gonna, I'm going to ask a, a, a couple of questions about siblings. So how many of you uh, grew up with siblings? Okay. Now keep, keep your hand raised. Now, so the camera's on, but it's not on you guys, so you, don't have, you can be honest. How many of you got along with your siblings? Okay, how, how many of you uh, fought with your siblings? Okay, now, now we've got uh, more representation here. I'm the oldest of two siblings, and we got along pretty well uh, most of the time. I was, since being the oldest, I kind of like was bossy with him, and he sort of manipulated me sometimes. But on the, on the, on the whole, like we got along uh, pretty well. Uh, did you guys share clothes? Anybody share clothes? Which would be weird if it was the other gender, but okay. <clears throat> Any, anybody have like the experience of like hand-me-downs with, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, right. So you, like we have an interesting relationship with our um, siblings. There's actually some siblings in the room I'm starting to realize right now. So that, that's pretty interesting. So I want you to think about um, siblings because I think that's going to help you as we go along in the message to sort of relate to some of the things that you're going to be, be hearing. Because Jesus, did you know that he had siblings? Now, now they were half-siblings because Jesus was born a, of a virgin, but nevertheless, he had um, siblings. And we're introduced to them in Mark chapter 6. So let me just set the stage um, for Mark chapter 6. So Jesus... He's been going around the area of Galilee. He is healing people. He's performing exorcisms. He's starting to attract a crowd. He has um, called the disciples. He's even caught the attention of Jewish leaders in Jerusalem who don't really like what Jesus is doing. But the point is, is that Jesus is starting to be known, like he's gaining some notoriety. And so in Mark chapter 6, he goes to his hometown of Nazareth. Now, you might think, like, man, this is going to be like this hero's welcome, right? Like, this is going to be like one of the later stages of American Idol where the contestants are whittled down and they go back to hometown and there's people in the streets, like, yelling their name and all that. That's not what happens, actually, at all <laughs> in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Very small town, maybe like 200 people. Instead, their reaction is recorded in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And this is how we're introduced to Jesus' Jesus's siblings, kind of like in passing indirectly. There it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So in unbelief, the crowd reacts to Jesus, his hometown says, like, he, we're supposed to think that this guy is special? Like, he was the local carpenter, and he hasn't been around, and I've been kind of missing his work, right? I'm kind of maybe irritated with that. And plus, we know his family. I know his mom. I know his brothers. His sisters are standing right over there. Like, don't tell me that this guy is special. So that, that's how we're introduced to the siblings of, of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus had siblings? Like for some people, that, that's kind of scandalous, right? Uh, you, uh, if you have a Roman Catholic background, which I do, right? We didn't believe that Jesus had siblings because there's a belief in the Roman Catholic Church that Jesus was, I mean, uh, Mary wasn't just a virgin when she conceived of Jesus. She was perpetually a virgin her whole life. So there's this um, alternate ways of reading this verse, right? They have their own translation. You always have to be careful. If, if you go to a church where you have your own translation for your church that nobody else has, that you, there, you might want to look into that. But anyway, so they, they have this alternate way of uh, understanding it. Maybe it was his cousins. Maybe it was uh, Joseph's children from a previous marriage. Maybe Mary adopted some kids after Joseph died. There, there's these other explanations. But the easiest, most natural way to sort of read this is that after Jesus was born, uh, Joseph and Mary had more children, and then therefore Jesus had these, these half-siblings. Now, one of these half-siblings um, 
who grew up with Jesus, played with Jesus, maybe were Jesus' hand-me-downs, maybe like got mad at Jesus when Jesus started using the hammer that he just left. He was coming right back, you know. Uh, they have the sibling relationship was James, okay? So keep that in mind. James, he's the, he's the second oldest after Jesus. <clears throat> and James is interesting because James begins the first part of his life as sort of like this skeptical younger brother regarding Jesus. But then at the last part of his life, he's like this super prominent early church leader, right? So I, I want to focus our attention this morning on answering the question, well, how did that happen? Like, how does that happen? So we're going to kind of metaphorically take a photo album off the shelf of James's life, and we're going to open it up and look at some snapshots from his life. First, we're going to look at the first part of the album, and this will be the, the first point of our sermon this morning. And there we're going to see James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, and three different snapshots there. Then we're going to flip the pages, go back to the back of the photo album, and there we'll see snapshots of James, the brother of Jesus, as the prominent early church leader. And then at the end, we're going to answer, okay, so how did that happen? So let's begin with James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, looking at the first part of the album. So let's think back uh, about your, your siblings, all right? See if you can get them. Imagine the face of your sibling or siblings. Um, how many of you, like your experience of your sibling was, like they were really hard to understand sometimes? like with reference to what they did, <laughs> Maggie's nodding, what they did or what, or what they said. Like it's just like, man, why would they do that? Why would they, they say that? Like maybe some of you have that um, experience. How many of you, I mean, you love your siblings, right? But if you're honest, you would say like, well, I, I was sometimes kind of embarrassed by them, like what they did and, and, and what they said. And then um, lastly, how many of you had a moment if, can you think of a moment where uh, you wish you would have stood up for your sibling, but you didn't? I wonder if any of you have that kind of a, a moment. So if, if James were here, the brother of Jesus, he would raise his hand for like all three of those questions, uh, um, right? And so I'm going to illustrate that by looking at three snapshots from his early life. So the, the first snapshot comes from Mark chapter 3. And here's the situation there. So we saw Jesus, he returns to his hometown of Nazareth, but now he's going to return to his home base of his Galilean ministry. When he was doing ministry in Galilee, when he, after he'd grown up, he had a home base in a house in the town of Capernaum. Okay, And see, what would happen is when he would come back into town, word would get out, Right? And then a crowd would start to form, and it would kind of be sort of a, it could be a problem, or at least you could interpret it as a problem uh, in, in some ways. Back in Mark chapter 2, for example, this happens, and the house is so crowded that they open up the roof, and then they lower down the paralytic. So this is that house, probably belonging to Peter and Andrew. So this is now the situation again in Mark chapter 3. And then we read this in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then he went home. Jesus went home, his home base in Capernaum. And the crowd gathered again, just like in Mark chapter 2, so that they could not even eat. Like he, the house is so crowded, you can't even eat. And when his family heard it, Jesus' family, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. That's his family. And then if you skip down to verse 32, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, they're saying to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Right? Okay, so in the first snapshot from James's, James's photo album, we see James with his mother and his brothers, and they're going to retrieve Jesus. Now, why probably Joseph has passed at this point? The sisters are at home, maybe. But they're going to go and retrieve Jesus. Now, why? Why would they do that? Well, because he's causing undue attention to himself. And then 
On top of that, he's bringing shame upon the family, right? So those, I'm looking at Dell, right? And those of us who come from Mediterranean backgrounds or, or Eastern backgrounds, we know that people don't just judge you as an individual, right? They judge you through the lens of your whole family, right? So if, if one of you in the family is bringing, doing crazy stuff, right? Saying crazy things, doing wild things, well, we got to address that person because they're shaming the whole family. So it, that's what they're doing. They're going to go retrieve Jesus, seize him. Same word for arrest, actually. They're going to seize Jesus and pull him away because he's causing shame with his crazy ideas. Now, you can't really blame them, actually, right? If you think about because Jesus, <laughs> Jesus says all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't know if you've noticed, right? We're used to it because we hear it in church all the time. But if you really just think about the things that Jesus says, that's a lot of crazy things to say. Like, for example, already Jesus says, um, I forgive your sins, he said to the paralytic. And, Jesus, <laughs> brother, like imagine if you're James. God is the only one who can forgive sins. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's right. You're like, whoa. <laughs> a little bit later he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, brother, you're saying no one can have a relationship with God unless they go through you? Like, think about your sibling. Like, what if your sibling said that? Like, that's crazy, right? And so in this snapshot, we learn from James, it's like, well, he has a hard time with some of the things that Jesus is doing and saying, and he's kind of embarrassed by it. Jesus. So that's the first snapshot. The second snapshot comes from John chapter 7. There the context is um, the Feast of Booths. So that's like a, a pilgrim festival where all the Jews from the surrounding area, they go up to Jerusalem to commemorate what God did for the children of Israel while they were wandering through the wilderness. And it's also a way to thank God for the fruitfulness of Canaan and, to, and the harvest and all of that is going into it. But if you remember, Jesus at this point is avoiding Jerusalem, right? In John chapter 7, verse 1, the reason is because the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus, is what it, it says. So Jesus is holding back um, from Jerusalem. Now, the reason given for why the Jews started to seek to kill Jesus is found in John chapter, a little bit earlier, in John chapter 5, verse 18. Because he was saying that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That's what John 5, 18, uh, uh, 5, 18 says. So, all right, there's that, there's that situation. Then we read this in John chapter 7, beginning in verse 3. So his brothers said to him, to Jesus, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. Right, so that's what they're assuming that Jesus wants, <laughs> to be known openly. And then it says, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then here's the reason, verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Then verse 6. Jesus said to them, to his brothers, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to the feast, at least not in public, for my time has not yet fully come. So Jesus is saying to his brothers, Look, you, you can go to Jerusalem any time you want to because you will be received by the world there, right? And Jesus is referring to the evil world system. So this is Jesus's, he's implicitly saying, you're worldly because you're worldly. But the world hates me, right? Because I call out the world. So I'm not going to go to Jerusalem yet, I'm going to go to Jerusalem when it's time for me to lay down my life. Then I'm going to go up to Jerusalem uh, um, publicly. 
So we learn a couple of things about James and his brother um, from this snapshot, don't we? We, we learn that he's, he's religious. He's religious. He goes to, at least culturally, like he, he'll go up to a religious festival. He would come to an Easter service easily. He's religious. But he's also unbelieving, and he's also worldly, Jesus said. And, and so we're not surprised then that he would give worldly advice. Okay, so you think you're a big shot. You're having all these claims. Why don't you go make yourself known in Jerusalem um, is their advice uh, uh, to Jesus, right? And, and we're uh, familiar with this kind of scenario, right? We probably all know people who are religious. They're, they're, we know they're religious. They may be even good moral people, but they miss the heart of God because the heart of God is to have you know him through Jesus and to submit to his loving reign, not to tell Jesus what to do and how to run things. Okay, so that's the second snapshot from James's life. The third comes at the crucifixion. So there is no indication in the Gospels that any of the brothers of Jesus come to faith during his earthly ministry. So we're not surprised when they're not there at the crucifixion. None of his biological brothers are there at the crucifixion, and hardly any of his spiritual brothers are there either, actually, except for who? John. John's there. And that's why Jesus says, in reference to John, when he's talking to his mother Mary, who's also there, he says, woman, behold your son. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm the older brother. Uh, you need to be taken care of. Joseph is dead. Somebody needs to take care of you. The biological brothers aren't here. They're not following, right? So I want you to be taken care of by John. We read that in John chapter 19. We talked about that last, last week. So what have we seen about um, James so far? Embarrassed by Jesus, right? He doesn't understand his actions. He thinks he's crazy. He's unbelieving. He's worldly. He doesn't even have the guts to stand by his brother at his darkest moment at the crucifixion. That's the first part of the album. When you go to the second part of the album, you get a radically like different James. And this is our second point. James, the prominent church leader. So let's think back at your siblings, okay? Bring up your siblings again. Let's upload them. All right? <clears throat> Now, would it, would it shock you, would it be troubling to you if you learned that your sibling was killed by government officials for starting a movement that they deemed dangerous to society? Well, yeah, like that would be kind of shocking to learn that. Now, would you, knowing that, knowing that that's why they were killed, would you then volunteer to be the leader of that, another leader in that movement? Right? <laughs> Josh would. He's okay with that. Right? Like, it doesn't feel very, I mean, maybe, like, depending on the movement, right? But if James were here, he would say, yep, that's, that's my story. Right? So if you, if you look now back at the photo album, let's look at some other snapshots now of the latter part of James's life. The first snapshot comes from an upper room in Jerusalem. And there, James is participating in a very early Christian prayer meeting there, where it kind of culminates in choosing Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus. Right? And so we read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. There it says, all these with one accord, everyone there with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Okay, so James is at this uh, prayer meeting. Like, what, what's he doing at the prayer meeting? Now, people go to prayer meetings, right? Like, you could give a variety of answers to why he was there. So, okay, that's the first snapshot. 
The second snapshot comes from the book of um, Galatians. So the book of Galatians is a letter in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul against the teaching of the Judaizers. Do you remember the Judaizers? So this is what the Judaizers taught. They said, you follow Jesus, great. You walk by the Spirit, wonderful, right? But that's not enough. Wow. That's, that's not enough, right? If you're a Gentile, then you need to become a Jew right? and, and take on all the Jewish markers, dietary markers, calendar markers, and especially physical markers such as circumcision. Then you'll know that you are actually truly part of the people of God. So Paul writes the book of Galatians to say, no, like, no, that's not the gospel. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. The, the way that you become part of the people of God is through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, not by works of the law, not by anything you do. In fact, any other message is a false gospel, is what um, Paul says. How foolish are you to think that you would begin your journey with Jesus by the Spirit and then be perfected by the flesh, he says in Galatians chapter 3, 3. So then what Paul does is he kind of shows that he has the authority to say something like that in two ways. He says, I have the authority to say something like this because God himself gave me this message. That's one thing. But then he adds something to that. He says, and my message has been confirmed by church leaders in Jerusalem, namely Peter and James. Not James, this is where it can get confusing sometimes. Not James, the brother of John. He is one of the earliest um, martyrs. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 12. So that James is dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Right? And so we read this in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Then after three years, this is Paul speaking, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. And then verse 19. But I saw none of the other apostles except, I saw one other apostle, I saw none of the other apostles except James, the brother of Jesus. <laughs> Wait a minute. Right. Okay, it's one thing to be at a prayer meeting. Right. Okay, so now he's an apostle. Now, when did, what, when did that happen? Right. Then later in, in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 2, after 14 years, Paul goes back to Jerusalem to check his message against, the, quote, those who seem to have influence, is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2. And then he says... And they added nothing to me. In other words, like they didn't add anything to my message, Galatians 2, 6. And then we read this in verse 9. And when James, still talking about the brother of Jesus, and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, right? If, if the church is like a metaphorical temple, Peter, James, and John are like pillars, is, is what Paul is saying. Perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So what Paul is saying is, okay, it's, it's my message that I'm proclaiming. Like, I'm not the only one proclaiming it, but it's my message, not the message of the Judaizers that has the official endorsement from the Jerusalem church and the leaders there. So, from the second snapshot, what do we learn about James? He doesn't just go to prayer meetings. He's an influential apostle, and he's also a pillar of the church. But to really understand what kind of influence James, the brother of Jesus, had, you have to go to Acts chapter 15. This is our third snapshot from the latter part of his photo album. This is about the Jerusalem council. So one of the earliest issues, and we saw it in Galatians, uh, of the early church was what should we expect of uh, Gentile Christians with regard to the Old Testament law? Like what should our expectation be with regard to the Old Testament law for the, for the Gentiles? 
And so what they do is the church of Antioch, Antioch sends dele delegates, namely Paul and Barnabas, to Jerusalem to meet with the elders and the apostles there. And they, and they have like this council, this meeting. So like imagine like a smaller version of the Senate floor or some, something like that. And it says in verse 7 of Acts chapter 15, there was much debate. So you can imagine like being there. And, and then after uh, Peter stands up and he like gives his speech, right? And then Barnabas, he gives his speech. And, and, and then Paul gives his speech with regard to how he feels about this thing. And then we read this in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 13. After they finished speaking, everyone's done speaking now. James replied, James, the brother of Jesus, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles. So Peter said that to take from them a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree. And then he quotes Amos chapter 9 to kind of say, like, this is not new, like God had always had in his mind to include the Gentiles. And then we read this in verse 19. Therefore, my judgment. Wow. <laughs> wow. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Then James gives a short list of activities that the Gentiles should not participate in, mainly to protect their testimony with the Jews. And then the council is over. Then they write up an official letter and they send it out with, with delegates. Okay, so what have we learned from these snapshots regarding James? At the beginning of the album, skeptical brother, embarrassed by Jesus. Religious, unbelieving, worldly, too scared to stand by Jesus at the cross. At the end of the album, influential apostle, pillar, apparently has the last word at the Jerusalem council. It's like, okay, so what, like, what's this radical transformation happens? Now, this, this is encouraging um, to me when I think about um, unbelieving relatives. Like, maybe some of you have unbelieving relatives. And sometimes from our vantage point, we think like, man, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure if that dude is savable. You know what I mean? Like he, he thinks I'm crazy for following Jesus, right? He's religious. Sometimes that makes it feel worse, right? So he doesn't maybe see his need or her need for Jesus, right? Or maybe they're really su successful in the world. Like Don and I were talking about this past week regarding her father. Didn't come to Jesus because he was too successful in the world until the very end of his life, and then he found his need for Jesus, and, and he was saved. Praise God. But we think, like, man, they're just unsavable. But when we think that, right, maybe you know better than to say it out loud, right? But when you think that in your heart, you are greatly misunderstanding the gospel, right? The gospel is the power of God under salvation. This is about God's power. Right? If you are following Jesus today, it's, it's not because you are really good at weighing all the evidence. That's not what happened. Like you're, you're, it's not because I make really great moral choices. That's not, sorry to tell you, that's not what happened. Like if you are following Jesus today, God saved you. Like I had no intention of following Jesus. Zero, in, I made fun of people for following Jesus. Zero intention following Jesus. I wasn't thinking about it, wasn't weighing the evidence, wasn't going to do it. Right, but then God came. <laughs> he, and he opened my eyes by the power of his spirit. I saw the beauty of his son, and I couldn't help but follow Jesus. Right, so he, like I didn't become a perfect person, but I changed. Right, God did that by his power he did that. But the question remains, okay, how, like, how did this transformation happen. How did James go from this to this, right? I can tell you this. It wasn't because he wanted to try out another religious system, right? He, he was, oh, well, I've been, you know, I've been a Jew for so long, and so have my ancestors for hundreds and hundreds of years, but let me just try this new, like, Christianity thing out. Like, it wasn't even, like, 
anything yet, right? In, in the minds of most people, right? That's not what happened. He had a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus, right? So this is our third point. And then now we go back to the words that were read to us by Wendy. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once. most of whom are still alive. So you can go talk to those guys, is what Paul is saying. Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus. That's why he's at the prayer meeting. <laughs> That's why he's there. That's why he becomes a prominent leader. Right? He was changed. And it's, it's, it's a misnomer to call it a, like a movement, right? It's like a, like it's not like just like principles to live by or even principles to die by. Like it's a kingdom that was inaugurated by Jesus, a living king, right? Who wants a personal relationship with each one of you. He doesn't want to just reign over his subjects. He wants to actually reign with them in the future. He sh God is a God who shares his power with people. What in the world? Like in Jesus, he's the king of this kingdom and he imparts life. Now there are, um, did you guys know that there are objections to the resurrection? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it never happened before. <laughs> like no one ever raised from the dead before and, and no one has been raised from the dead since in this kind of way. So yeah, it makes sense that there would be objections to the resurrection. But what's interesting regarding, like, the most skeptical of historians will at least concede, they'll concede one thing. And they'll say that we can, we can verify this, we, we will count this as historical fact. Even the most skeptical historian will say that the apostles, the early apostles, including James, claimed, claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. Like, that's all they're going to give us. Okay. That's all you give us. That's fine. So what are the three possibilities? Like how you have to explain the rise of Christianity somehow. I mean, have you noticed? It's kind of like everywhere. Like, so how did that happen? Right? So there's three possibilities if that's the only thing that's given to you. One, well, it was an individual and mass hallucination. That's one possibility. Second, they were lying to preserve the teachings of their master. That is perhaps another possibility. Or third, he rose from the dead. So those are the kind of like the three possibilities. So let's think about them. There were, if this is a product of individual and mass hallucinations. Now there's different kinds of hallucinations. Like Andrew Gibson and I had pretty close to uh, auditory uh, hallucination in the hallway this morning. We heard like somebody speaking, and I don't know what that was about. Uh, so, but a visual hallucination is actually like that's pretty rare, like to happen. Okay, that's on one level. But a mass hallucination, like 500 people at once, that's impossible. Like it, it just doesn't happen because what is a hallucination? It's created by your own mind. Like this is a party of one. Like, you can't invite other people to that party. You, you, it's like a dream. Like, your mind creates a dream. You, you can't wake up your wife or your husband and say, hey, join me in this dream. Like, it, it doesn't work like that. So the hallucination theory, it just doesn't seem very plausible to me. Perhaps slightly more plausible is to say, OK, well, maybe, maybe they lied. They lied to preserve the legacy of their master. Perhaps that's the way to explain it. But to believe that, you'd have to believe that people who highly valued truth and were known, like they had a reputation for highly valuing truth. James outside of the Bible is known as James the Just. 
right, because he was a person of integrity. Outside the Bible, he's, he's known that way. That they, these people who highly value truth, decided on one very important point to lie and conspire together to protect the teachings of a teacher who was all about truth and who said of themselves, I am the way and the truth. So that seems unlikely, but, you know, maybe, you know, thinking long term, you might do that. But then you add on top of that saying, and they're willing to be beaten, stoned, whipped, imprisoned, and then killed for something that they know is a lie. <laughs> I mean, that, I don't know about, that's, it's hard for me to believe that. There's certain things that have to be kind of in place for conspiracies to, like, last. Like, for, for a lie to be presented as truth, right? That would be, a, you conspire with somebody to, like, hey, let's present this lie as a truth. How does that last? Well, the lower amount of people, the better. Like, because, you know, I might not crack. Dell might not crack. We include the whole room. Well, somebody might crack, right? And low pressure, like low pressure to deny it. Then, you know, got, we just got a few people. There's not a lot of pressure. No one's going to crack. But this is a situation where there's lots of people and lots of pressure to deny Jesus. Okay. Yet you, you have to realize all the apostles minus one who was exiled to Patmos, which is not the best outcome, like from a worldly standpoint, all the apostles were killed, including James, the brother of Jesus. So if you, if you go at the very last page of his earthly life in his photo album, though you'll, you'll find a pretty gruesome picture. And this comes to us through Josephus, who is a Jewish first century historian, Jewish, not Christian and from Eusebius, who is a church historian. And you look at those texts together, and the picture that emerges is that James, they want James to denounce the risen Christ at the Passover. They put him at the pinnacle in Jerusalem of the temple. He doesn't renounce the risen Christ. So what do they do? Push him off the temple. Right? He lands on the ground. He doesn't die. He's pretty hurt, but he doesn't die. So they stone him. And then somebody finishes it off by clubbing him. Now, we love our siblings. Right? Some of us would even die for our siblings. But are you going to die for your sibling regarding their resurrection if you knew that it didn't happen? It just seems really unlikely, doesn't it? And maybe one person, like, does it because they have, like, some mental issue, right? Everyone, like, all the apostles, like, none of them crack? I, I mean, to me, this is like, wow. Because James couldn't deny the risen Christ because his brother rose from the dead and appeared to him, right? and it changed his life, radically changed his life. Now, in, in some ways, James's story is unique, right? But not completely unique. If you pull off the album of Peter's life, for example, you're going to find a picture of them, of him there denying Jesus because a little girl asks him a question, right? And then you, you flip over a couple of pages, and there he is proclaiming the risen Christ before the Sanhedrin, the same people who condemned Jesus to death. You pull Peter, uh, uh, Paul's album off of the shelf. You open it up, you're going to find a picture of him overseeing the stoning of Stephen. You flip over a page, you're going to see him going to Damascus to do what? Drag back Christians, right, to kill them, right? But then you keep flipping the pages, and then it's page after page of Paul declaring the resurrected Jesus, being stoned for it, whipped for it, left for dead for it, imprisoned for it, and then dying for it. 
because Jesus, the resurrected Christ, appeared to him. Many people in the room, right? the resurrected Christ has come to you. It may be in a different way, but he's come to you. And the first part of the album of your life is very different from the second part of the album in your life. Because how do you, how do you account for that change in James and Peter and Paul in your own life? You have an encounter with the risen Christ. And my prayer for you, because this is a God thing. Like, this isn't like the power of my persuasive arguments or something like that. This is like God, God can meet you. You say, like, oh, you know what? I still have doubts. I still, I'm not sure. That's okay. Please be honest. Uh, bring those to God. And say, God, you're going to have to help me out here. Right? Will you meet me where I'm at? Because I am a sinner. And I do need forgiveness of my sins. And I want the life that you're talking about. I'm just not sure about that. Go to him. Go to him. And he will meet you. Let's pray together. Father, the whole history of the world culminates in this moment where you raised your son up from the dead. There is an empty grave. There is empty grave clothes. There are 500 plus eyewitnesses. Lord, but if you don't come and meet us where we're at, we won't see you for all that you are. Come and open our eyes. Help us to see you for all of your beauty and the beauty of your son. Do that by your spirit now, we pray. In his name, amen. We're going to be singing in the uh, back.